Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Thank you for joining us for today's panel discussion in the series Berlin Talks, offered to you by the FUBEST and FUBIS programs, two short-term international study programs at Freie Universität Berlin. On behalf of Freie Universität Berlin and the two sponsoring programs, it is my pleasure to welcome a wonderful panel tonight to talk about a very interesting and controversial topic and of course to welcome you, the audience, for joining us and we hope that this will be a fulfilling and interesting intellectually stimulating conversation uh, panel discussion. Just a brief word about the two sponsoring programs. The FU Best program at which I serve as one of the academic directors uh, is a semester-based program focused on liberal arts, social science and humanities courses, uh, German language training as well, and it is open to students from all over the world who spend one or two semesters here in the German capital. FUBIS is the Freie Universität Berlin International Summer and Winter University. It offers three terms in the course of the year, one in January and two during the summer, again also open to students from all over the world. And so these two programs have joined to create this series of panel discussions on timely topics. Uh, and we've had a series of them uh, over the last year and a half. And so today we have a wonderful topic for a panel discussion, populism, the question of democracy in Europe. Just a brief technical uh, word here. The event is being recorded, but you, the audience, is anonymous. You are anonymous. Your identity is, is hidden in this recording. Also, we invite you to use the chat function to submit questions or comments uh, that we can perhaps then turn to in the course of the discussion. Let me first introduce our panelists. Catherine Fieschi is a leading European politics expert whose main focus is on populism and other contemporary forms of mobilization and protest. She's the director of CounterPoint, a London-based research and advisory group that provides businesses, governments, and NGOs with strategic insights on how to manage new forms of social and political risk. She's also senior advisor to the macro advisory firm MAP and to the Pew Research Center. Prior to founding CounterPoint, she was director of the London think tank DEMOS. Dr. Fieschi is a long-standing advisor to European political leaders and campaigns. Her most recent book is Populocracy, published in 2019. She's widely published across academia and the media and is a regular political commentator. A native speaker of French, Italian and English, she holds a PhD in comparative politics from McGill University in Canada and lives in Paris. Nicole Leu is a research assistant and PhD candidate at the Otto Suhr Institute of Political Science at Freie Universität Berlin. She studied political science, sociology and economics in Bonn and Düsseldorf. Her dissertation project deals with populist attitudes and how they shape voting behavior political opinions, and social environments, especially in Germany. Besides the demand side of populism, she's interested in members of populist radical right parties and the development of the AFD, the right-wing party here in Germany. Sebastian Büttner is a political sociologist whose research focuses on contemporary transformations of governing, the link between politics and expertise, and on the study of Europeanization from a sociological perspective. He is assistant professor at the Institute of Sociology at the University of Erlangen-Nuremberg, here in Germany, and currently he's guest professor of macro sociology at the Institute of Sociology at Freie Universität Berlin. In one of his more recent research projects entitled EU Professionalism, a qualitative study of EU expertise, he analyzed the numerous forms of expertise that are linked with EU politics and policymaking on a transnational scale. Furthermore, he is author of Mobilizing Regions, Mobilizing Europe, Expert Knowledge and Scientific Planning in European Regional Development. 
in which he studied the structures and practices of EU regional policy from a sociological perspective and the emergence of new regions in Central and Eastern Europe. Kai Olaf Lang is a senior fellow at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs at the Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik, a foreign policy think tank based in Berlin. He holds a diploma in public administration and a PhD in political science. Previously, he worked as a research fellow at the Federal Institute for Eastern and International Studies in Cologne. His fields of specialization include the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, including their transformation, domestic political developments, foreign and security policy, and bilateral relations with Germany. He also specializes in EU enlargement and its implications, security issues in Central and Eastern Europe, and the European neighborhood policy. He is a member of a variety of organizations, forums, and boards in Germany, Poland, and the Czech Republic related to these research fields. Again, welcome to our panel tonight. As is our custom, we want to introduce the topic with some visuals, and we're going to show you some statistics uh, to give you a sense of what we're dealing with here uh, as, an, as an opener. And we will begin with this first one, uh, just to gain a historical perspective. Uh, this particular graph is showing us um, countries that have had populist governments, but in a worldwide sense, um, from 1900 to 2018. Uh, of course, it is always going to be a question, what is populism, as we will discuss it, and, and how do you classify countries? But one of the things that we see is that depending on how you apply the term populism, populism is not necessarily new. Uh, we see that there were waves of populism uh, in the uh, post-war one period, the interwar period, uh, then again also during the Cold War at times. But we see, of course, a large increase, uh, particularly since the year 2000. Also, what this graph shows is that there is an attempt made here, and we will see this also in the discussion, to distinguish between right-wing and left-wing populism. And we will look at what that means in terms of the agenda pursued by such uh, right-wing versus left-wing populist movements or groups, if that is a valid distinction. The next slide shows us populist in power, and it shows a more recent uh, graph since 1990. And we see here that the contemporary growth of populism uh, in terms of countries with populist governments, again, uh, worldwide, has been particularly since the year 2000, um, with a certain leveling off uh, since about 2015 or so. Um, and again, the, the graph only goes till 2020. As you can see here, this was put together by the uh, uh, Tony Blair Institute uh, for Global Change. The next slide that we will look at uh, is again also from the Tony Blair Institute from a report that appeared this year. And once again, there is an attempt made here to distinguish different types of populism and not so much the right wing versus left wing label, but rather three labels used here, cultural populism. So a very strong focus on identity politics, socioeconomic populism. So the, the haves versus the have nots kinds of issues. And then an anti-establishment populism, which also comes into play when we're looking at the impact of globalization and the way people may feel alienated from the political elite in their particular society. And what you see here is that the anti-establishment populism has been a steady level uh, since 1990, uh, a certain increase with socioeconomic populism, but a particularly uh, significant increase uh, since 2000 in the area of um, what is defined as cultural populism. We turn to a further picture. And here we see a map of Europe um, that was published in The Guardian on newspaper uh, in November of 2018 uh, to show countries and the, the darker the color, so to speak, uh, the more significant the presence of a populist vote at that point was. Uh, and so we see some countries, uh, for example, like Portugal, where there is hardly any impact, but others, uh, Italy, Hungary, Czech Republic, Poland, Bulgaria, 
uh, more significant. And then a number of large countries, Spain, France, Germany, uh, with also quite a significant seg segment of populist attitudes in, in politics. Then we go on and look here at specific countries here, eight countries are being shown here, and you see uh, how there has been a, a sort of a, a gradual growth, but it doesn't really get much for, in some cases, beyond about 25% uh, uh, of the vote. Um, again, support in this case for what are classified as right-wing populist parties or movements. And we see eight different countries here uh, being presented. Uh, we have one more. And that is here um, a, um, uh, a graph that shows the number of citizens who see immigration as one of the important issues facing their country. Uh, and of course, you see this spike around 2015, and we will definitely in the course of the, the discussion tonight come to talk about this whole wave of refugees that came in around 2015 that was in a way something that stoke the fire uh, of, of populism and populist reaction uh, to established politics in, in a number of European countries. Uh, but you, what you also see is that the number of people seeing that as a significant issue has declined in the years after that uh, again. And then we have another picture finally, and that is of course the speculation as to how populism interacts with the pandemic. And here the question is, uh, to what extent were populist groups or movements tempted to restrain themselves and support sitting governments in their policies or to what extent did they go on the attack uh, even more during the pandemic uh, so it's the so-called restrain versus attack distinction uh, and here we see that on the restraining side uh, are the populist groups um, in finland uh, the afd in germany to some extent um, in Sweden, uh, whereas the attack side uh, is much stronger in the case of France, and the Netherlands, and Spain. Uh, perhaps uh, some of our panelists will take issue with the classification here. We'll see how that, how that goes tonight. But immigration and the pandemic are two events uh, or factors that come into play here uh, as well. So that was just as, a, as an opener, some images here. Uh, and I'm going to now pose a question, as is also our custom, to all four panel members and uh, will then uh, invite them in turn to respond. And the first question is obvious and, and basic. Uh, in the title uh, today, we have the word populism and we have the word democracy. We're talking here about classical antiquity, the Latin word for people, populus, in the case of populism, and the Greek word demos, also for people in democracy. And so we're looking here at two concepts, democracy and populism, that both deal with the people, uh, but in a way that some people suggest is not compatible. In fact, that populism may even be a threat to democracy, to liberal democracy. Um, and so the opening question that I'd like to pose to our panel is, how do you in your own work, professional work, your, your own writing, your own research, how do you define populism? What do you see populism as? Is it a type of ideology? Is it a style of politics? Is it an agenda? Is it a mood? Um, what are some of the essential features of populism as you see it? And I would like to begin with Catherine Fieschi. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you much for the introduction and also um, <clears throat> for framing the discussion uh, really well with, uh, you know, with the, the various graphics here. Um, a very good way, very good way in. So, um, I think that the way in which uh, I think of populism in my work um, is not particularly original, I think, but um, it brings together uh, two key components. For me, populist uh, politics are first and foremost a politics uh, which for its supporters, but also for the leaders of populist movements and populist parties, a politics in which the struggle for power is not between uh, two classes or uh, parties on the left and parties on the right, but rather the struggle 
uh, for political power is between an elite, an establishment that is considered to be uh, to have usurped its position, uh, to be inherently uh, corrupt because it is more interested in preserving um, its own uh, elite privileges rather than actually represent the interest uh, uh, of the people who have uh, elected it or appointed it. Um, the people, on the other hand, are generally characterized, first of all, as being um, instinctively wise, um, as knowing instinctively uh, right from wrong, um, and to some extent, therefore, being the, the guardians uh, of, of national values, the guardians of national interest, the guardians of the right national political direction. That's the first component. The second component, which I think is very important, is that it is also a politics that posits um, that uh, a good political relationship between leaders or a leader uh, and uh, the people uh, is a direct one. It's a politics that is not premised on representation, quite the opposite. It's premised on a very direct relationship. And so populist politics would tend to try and uh, either get rid of representative institutions or bypass representative institutions um, in order to have a more uh, authentic relationship, but also, I think, a more um, what they would consider to be a more emotionally fulfilling, democratically uh, fulfilling kind of, uh, uh, of relationship, which is why, you know, just to finish on this, um, what we see in, in populism is not so much uh, that it is uh, incompatible with democracy, but it is certainly incompatible with a certain type of democracy and particularly representative democracy. Asking you, a sociologist, what is your angle on this? Um, dear Theodorus, thank you very much at first for the introduction and for inviting me to this talk. I didn't get at the beginning of what you said, but I um, assume that you approached me now and uh, you also asked me to give my definition, right? Um, I mean, Catherine already, I would say, uh, provided a very, very sophisticated definition of populism and um, I would align with what she said before. Um, when you ask me specifically what my definition would be, I mean, populism from a sociological perspective is can be different things. Yeah? At first, it is a social phenomenon. We look at social phenomena as sociologists and we try to make sense of it, compare it with other phenomena. For example, maybe technocratic politics, pop populism as a, soci as a social phenom phenomenon versus technocratic politics, for example. Uh, secondly, it can also be an articulation, an articulation of a certain political will of certain political demands and so on. And these articulations are linked with what Catherine already said. Yeah, it's the will of the people, mainly ordinary people, the, of an imagined community and so on. And so thirdly, from a sociological perspective, uh, perspective it's also um, always a strategy of group making and identity building. So very often populism is uh, used as a form of yeah, articulating the will and the self-understanding of a certain group. I think we we can, I could go further here, yeah, but I think we move on to other definitions and we go back to the sociological perspective. Thank you, Sebastian. Let me then turn to Nicole. Nicole, you, uh, in your research, focus very much on the AFD, on Germany, but of course have a broader sense as a political scientist when it comes to, to populism. What's your angle on this? Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. And um, in my PhD, to, just to clarify this, I um, study um, populist voters. So it's not only the AFD, but it's more um, the demand side of populism, which is maybe not the best known side because populist parties and politicians are um, or often in the focus of popular studies. So um, I follow, and this is very much what Catherine already said, I follow, uh, follow the ideational approach of populism, which understands populism as a, um, a thin-centered ideology, um, which means that populism is a set of ideas um, con 
which um, are three main characters, um, uh, people-centrism, anti-elitism, and anti-pluralism. So for my measurement of populism um, as an empirical political scientist, um, all, three, um, all three features have to be there, then we can speak of populism. Um, and um, which is maybe a perspective that we can discuss later because in the in the slides you showed um, at the beginning you focus very much on uh, the populist radical right side which is um, I think uh, um, always in the focus of uh, of the Western European perspective um, but in my studies it's more like populism is um, is a specific understanding of democracy um, and it's not um, a left one or a right wing uh, one on the first side. It's just a specific way um, to understand how a society and how politics should work. Um, so maybe we can um, later discuss um, populism without the right or left wing uh, label later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicole. Um, Kai Olaf, uh, your focus, as we will still hear more about it, is, is very much on Central and Eastern Europe, but also from you as an opener, your broader perspective on, on populism um, beyond the, the, the regional specifics the, uh, that, that come into play, perhaps, uh, your overall sense of, of populism that guides your research. Yeah, thank you, Theodorus, and thank you for the invitation. And what, what can I add? I might say that uh, in order to spark a little bit our debate, that I'm increasingly uncomfortable and, 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 and I feel a, a sort of uneasiness using the notion of populism. Because very often, populism is everything we don't like. So it's in the political, in the media discourse, it's a, a very often, it, 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 um, it has a sort of under complexity. At the same time, I think it has some merits if we use it as, a, as an analytical category. And I have, in a way, two, two thoughts about populism. I have a pragmatic notion and, and a, more, uh, a more general understanding. The, the pragmatic understanding would be, it's, it's a way of doing politics which um, uh, is based on a predilection for a strong friend and foe identification. So populism is inherently something which, uh, which has a strong side of, of antagonism. It is a way of doing politics which has, and here I would agree to what has been said, uh, a clear vertical dimension in defining the political field. It's not so much the, the traditional left-right axis, but it is us uh, and against against the the establishment or uh, or the elite. And it's it's also um, a way of doing politics, which often goes along with an attempt to create a, a community, so Gemeinschaft, as opposed to society to to Gesellschaft. The more the more um, systematic or the more the, the broader definition on, on, on my part would be populism is the promise of repoliticization in the name of authenticity and recognition. So what does it mean? What are the components of that? Repoliticization, because so-called populist movements or leaders often claim, and in a way, they are not completely, they, they, there is a, an element of truth in it, that the political space has become more and more narrow through technocratic politics. And they promise to open up the political space. There is a, a, an interesting notion which Jarosław Kaczynski, the leader of the Polish Law and Justice Party once used in the context of his judicial reform, where he said, I don't, we have to overcome legal impossibilism. Uh, he himself is a lawyer, but he says that the well, lawyers always say us, it's not possible to do reforms, to do something. We have to overcome, overcome that. So that's a promise of, of a return of the political. And then I think authenticity, yes, because usually these leaders claim to have a special, um, a special feeling for what common people uh, want. And last but not least, and I think that's something we have for a very long time underestimated in domestic political affairs, but also in international relations, uh, the quest for recognition. 
Yeah, people want to be acknowledged. It's the the the, the tumos, the thymus of Platon, and I think in a way populists are um, the governors of of anger, but also of the of the of the wish and the desire of many people for being recognized. But I, I will stop here with this uh, with with my understanding. Thank you very much, Kai Olaf. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, now, all of you have already addressed the the context within which this populist phenomenon in Europe is taking place, and that is the context of our liberal democracies. And the tendency, certainly in the media, in much of the coverage, uh, tends to be that populism is a danger to democracy and is incompatible with democracy. But reading into some of your comments, uh, I get the sense that we need to be more nuanced in the way we look at this. And so I'd like to ask Catherine in this case, um, uh, is populism by definition anti-democratic or is it something that actually a healthy democracy needs? Uh, how do you see the relationship between democracy and populism? So I think that um, I think the relationship between democracy and populism is almost symbiotic. Um, you know, in my in my sense, um, you almost cannot have populism unless you've got a democratic promise that uh, people feel is being betrayed. So this is why um, I think you know populism is not new, but it is contemporary in the sense that I think it goes hand in hand with both technocratic and also mass politics. So no, they're 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 not they're not um, antithetical. In fact, as I you know I think that they're intrinsically uh, intrinsically linked. But I think what's what's important here is not so much, and I have colleagues who argue that. Um, you know, that perhaps, you know, populism, you know, is, is a healthy thing. It's a corrective to democracy, uh, a little bit sort of, you know, the canary, you know, that sings in the mind before everything goes wrong. Um, I think it's a very dangerous canary. So I'm not entirely sure that, you know, that it's a, it's a healthy development. But I think that it's an inevitable development um, of, of, mass, uh, of mass democracy and of the complexification you know, uh, of, of our democracies, um, the complexification of policymaking, um, the fact that um, increasingly in order for governments to deliver, particularly in the context of welfare states, right, that are inherent to the way in which uh, many Western democracies, uh, you know, think of, of, of themselves in the context of a, of a welfare state, um, you've got incredibly complex decisions to make. And this is when, you know, technocracy, you know, whether you like it or not, becomes, you know, the necessary tool. You need to put people in categories. You need to measure what you give to them. You need to assess on what basis you're going to deliver some of these services. And so then I think, you know, democracy takes this, this technocratic this technocratic route, and often you see populists accusing, um, you know, the the established elite and and the technocrats and the experts, as we've seen, you know, more recently, um, you know, accuse them of a bloodless politics, right? A politics that, in a sense, has evacuated, you know, and gotten rid of its of its human side. And you know, Margaret Canavan, you know, who's one of the great authors and early authors of uh, uh, in populist studies. You know, was you know was very eloquent about this, and you know, and she was basically saying, you know, a healthy democracy is a mix between a kind of effective, efficient, complex technocracy, and at the same time, the capacity to be recognized, to be visible, uh, you know, to be understood in in your humanity. If you veer too much toward the technocratic, then you're going to have this unease that comes up and that is easily weaponized and and uh, and manipulated uh, by populist leaders. Um, and they inject a dose of, you know, uh, a, a dose of, of, of humanity, but also not just a dose of authenticity. And, and I hope we come back to the discussion of authenticity because it's a big part of what I've studied, but they also inject what I would call a dose of kind of emotionalism, right? And almost sentimentalism, uh, you know, about what it's like to be a democratic subject and or, 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 or a democratic citizen. 
Thank you, Catherine. Um, Nicole, um, we are observing the phenomenon of populism in Europe in the context of democracies that are supposed to be representative democracies and which offer meaningful participation. Uh, but also some of what Catherine just said, uh, for many people, there's a sense that their participation is not relevant. Uh, is not authentic, to use that word, uh, is not effective, that technocrats are in charge. Um, so is populism a way to provide further avenues of participation to broader groups of people? At the same time, my question to you would be, to what extent are some of these populist leaders actually themselves also product of an elite, of an establishment, uh, as they rose to the top uh, in, in, in the uh, political life of their country. Can you comment on that, on the, the question of participation and, and uh, the populism uh, phenomenon as a, as a mobilization for participation mm -hmm. in representative democracy? Yeah, it's um, for people with holding populist attitudes, it's a dilemma because they, on the one side, they have this output legit legitimacy in mind for, for, pop uh, for, for politics. They just want it to function. So they're interested that the output of a democracy is the same thing as their view on something. So um, on the other hand, they are not living in a system where they are their views are actually kind of the the common ground for for making up politics. So um, they have to participate because they are not living in a populist democracy. They are living in a democracy where um, representation and um, um, and consensus and uh, finding compromises uh, compromises are. Um, the the modes of politics. So they have to participate, and this is what when if you ask them, they want to they want a more direct form of democracy, but more on a on a theoretical level. Because you can ask them that if you want to if they want to participate in more refer, in a referendum or in deliberative um, 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 uh, politic uh, politics. So say they say yes. But on the other hand, if you have a look, um, uh, what um, if they take if they are um, taking actions and demonstrations, or if they give their uh, give their vote to a referendum, they uh, they not doing this. So if with increasing populist attitudes, these people are less likely to uh, participate in demonstration, for example. So in the on a theoretical level, populism can be a, a driving force for participation because they want to have um, people with populist attitudes want to have a, a different kind of democracy. Um, on the other hand, they want a political leader that is just capable of seeing or hearing the the general will or the uh, um, or their will, um, and um, this is this is the opposite of of participation. So it's it's not really it's not a yes or no uh, on this question um, because it's not really what they want and what they are doing is the same here. Um, and on your second question. Um, the populist leader, yes, they are parts of the elite. I mean, if you, if we, if we have a closer look at Donald Trump, he's the the elitist leader on every uh, on every level. But the different in the populist way is that the leader just has to has to see what this volonté général is and say that he's acting on this will and not on his self-interest. So it's not really the question if you are if the leader is um, part of a political elite or is rich or is something like this. It's more like he he or she must um, must must act on this general will and not on their self-interest. And if they can, um, and this is there, and this should be their, uh, their guiding line for politics. So then you can be part of an elite and a populist leader on the same time. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, turning now to Sebastian, I want to turn again back into a broader uh, sociological direction and, and away from just the, the political dynamics. Um, and uh, perhaps, uh, Sebastian, you can address the, the question of identity 
uh, here. Uh, people also talk about identity politics, of course. Uh, I'm thinking here, for example, of the research, uh, sociological research that was done in, in Britain in the background of Brexit, uh, where the distinction was made between what were called anywheres and somewheres. Anywhere is the people who feel comfortable with globalization, who feel that they can fit in in, in a fast-changing world, and the somewhere is the people who need uh, roots, uh, who need what in German would be called Heimat, uh, you know, who need the, the 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 roots of a particular region and, and so on. Uh, the the question of of identity as it plays into uh, populist sentiment or the, the, the inclination to follow uh, a populist appeal. From a sociological point of view, uh, how insignificant is the question of identity here? Yeah, thank you for this question. I mean, obviously, as I said before, um, populism is linked with um, group making or like the imagination of groups and with identities. Of course, um, it is a crucial feature of populism. Um, identity politics and also the the discussion, the discourse, the debate about self-understanding. So who we are and who I am and where I am standing. So to put it very simple. But before I address your question, I would again at least briefly go one step um, back to to the discussion before um, the question about. Yeah, is there a danger of populism with regard to democracy? And I try to link it also with the, with the identity question. And um, I mean, I think you will always get the answer. Yes, pop a certain element of populism is maybe even essential for democracy and that, that people are mobilized into politics, that they articulate their polit political will. And you will always get people who say, well, we should be careful that this can also be da dangerous and so on. And I think we have these two distinctions and we have this, we have this, let's say, major extremes. On the one hand, is politics um, like a business that is mainly in the hands of experts and should be in the hands of experts? And on the other hand, is, is democracy and politics about um, the will of the people and then you have different imaginations of what the people are and my major point is when and when democracy was invented if it was invented like we we now um, imagine it like this it was invented in greek of course it was it was at that time as well and again not the whole population but a certain share of the population that mainly participated in politics so now when we move um, back to today and you ask me about identity and identity politics, of course, um, populism is a strategy to um, build um, like alignments or like build certain, uh, yeah, certain solidarity amongst people against something, against the establishment, against uh, people who are in power and um, and how do you how do you mobilize solidarity within a group? You need an enemy. You need to address certain problems. You need to um, yeah, think of a crisis, and you, and you need to describe the crisis. And this is exactly what is done in populist uh, strategies. And so this is one thing. And the second thing, um, very often um, these questions today, of course, um, about um, who we are and 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 who we should be is linked with immigration and the question of immigration and the question who is part of the society and who is not. And of course, this is linked with the, with, um, the changes within society and also the perception that the nation state, and you already addressed this issue, that the welfare state maybe, if there is a welfare state, in many countries there, there is no welfare state, if the, if the nation state, if the political system um, uh, serves serves the people and and who the political um, to 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 whom the political system should serve and so in this sense um, populism is a an articulation of a certain group that defines itself as a as a group um, against um, perceived others and um, you you mentioned and this is my final my my last point. You mentioned the debate about the somewheres and the, and the anywhere, anywheres, and then the sociological debate. 
there is um, discussion about the distinction between people living in the city, sharing their cosmopolitan lifestyles and so on, versus people on the countryside, people who might feel left behind from economic changes, people um, in living in de-industrialized de areas. And today, um, of course, very often populism, mainly right-wing, sometimes also left-wing, mobilizes people who feel uh, detached from, from society and nature, um, centers of society. And, in, in, and, and here identity is um, like mobilized as a nature element. Thank you very much, uh, Sebastian. Um, Kai Olaf, uh, your colleagues on the panel have addressed so far very broad issues uh, dealing with Europe as a whole, or even extending beyond Europe, just more of a philosophical general nature. Um, your area of expertise lies particularly in Central and Eastern Europe. And so, based on, on what you've heard so far, um, are there particular driving forces behind the populist phenomenon in Central and Eastern Europe that are specific to that region? Uh, are they historical? Uh, do they have to do with, with the legacy of communism and, and so on that are specific to that area? And, or to what extent does it fit into the broader general picture? Of course, there are some, some of the general tendencies we can also observe in, in this part of Europe, but I think there are there is a couple of um, there are a couple of idiosyncrasies, and I would I would like to highlight especially three three clusters or you know, complexes of drivers which play a role um, here. And I think they're also instructive for what is going on in other parts of the European Union. But of course, we have to be aware that this is these are countries which have undergone dynamic and profound changes after 1989 and that they have been in a particular situation before i think the first huge driver is for for the success of parties like like uh, law and justice in poland and, and many others is what i call um the, the two two desencantos you know which took place two waves of disappointment the first one in the early 1990s when um people were disillusioned about uh, the so-called uh, social economic transformation when people saw that this would be a very long and tough way to go to to move to the standards of living in in, in western europe but the first this this first desencanto led in most countries rather to the return of former communist parties of, of, of ex-communist successor parties but then came a second, a second disencanto after the accession to the European Union. And here again, as so after 2004, 2007, here again, the, the political economy of time played a certain role because the fact that the countries joined the European Union symbolically meant that they were part, that they now were part of the richer part of the European, of Europe. But uh, most most of um, uh, the, the most parts of the societies were not rich yet, so uh, there was a, an element of, of impatience and a new a new a new disencanto. Uh, so this kind of the lost promises, or the broken promises of the system transformation later on of the uh, of the membership of the European Union, at least for many, uh, led to a, a wave of success. Um, the second, the second element of, of drivers um, has something to do with modernization. Uh, so, of course, these countries have are in a, in, a, in a process of 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 um, of, of dynamic uh, modernization. And what we could observe during the 1990s was a paradigm of um, of convergence of asymmetric harmonization with the West. So the West had the recipes uh, of introducing democracy and, and market economy. And uh, this was even stronger during the accession process yeah, because they, had, they wanted to join the club, these countries, and they had to accept certain rules, um, certain, but also certain ways of living in a way which were more and more present. And uh, at least parts of the societies um, didn't want to follow that way. 
And I think the uh, populist movements, uh, not only populist, but also populist movements, uh, uh, felt that there is a rising demand for questioning the, uh, the, 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 the dominance of liberal universalism. So that's one of the of the buzzwords you hear in many and many countries of the region that they want to go their own path and uh, will not do a sort of imitating modernization. So what we see here, that's my assessment. Uh, sociolo famous sociologist uh, um, Eisenstadt uh, called this the multiple modernity. So in, in, there are parts of the world where we have societies and countries which are modernizing but in a different way than the old liberal West has done that. And this word of this, this, this way of alternate, uh, alternative uh, modernization now is present in some European countries, obviously. So uh, if you look at Poland or Hungary, they have governments which are very keen in, uh, uh, in having competitive modern infrastructures and economies, but at the same time, they want to preserve and to solidify traditional values. And the third element, and I think this plays a special role here, but not only here, uh, in, in, this, in, this, in this part of Europe, that's the, the external foreign policy dimension. So part of the narrative which you have in national conservative groupings here is that um, uh, they want to overcome a situation of post-colonialism. So in, in their, in their uh, reading, the liberal elites have opened up their countries and have established a sort of uh, yeah, post-colonial mentality. And they have, uh, like the uh, Polish-American um, uh, Slavist Eva Thompson once called it, they were looking for a substitute hegemon you know, after the Soviet Union went apart. So, the US or uh, or Germany or, or others. And, and these groupings emphasizing uh, sovereignty, the restoration of, 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 of autonomy, also taking into a part the, uh, the difficult history where many of these nations had no state, for example, um, they obviously also find some, uh, some, some support. So, um, here, I think we, we see a couple, a couple of interesting or of important elements, which we in a different form probably can also maybe see in, in, in Southern Europe or in, in, um, in, Western, in Western Europe. So it's in a way a combination of bread and butter issues, yeah, social uh, questions here in, in Poland, where, where I am at the moment. Uh, uh, the Prime Minister Morawiecki and others uh, uh, say, our core project is the building of a conservative welfare state. Yeah, so, so it's a rather uh, social left of center approach when it comes to economic questions, but it's a rather traditionalist uh, conservative approach when it comes to cultural, cultural issues. In Hungary, the situation is different in a way, um, which also tells us, I think, that Populism is a very heterogeneous phenomenon and that uh, successful populist movement, movements are able to adjust to the situation, to the, the, the preference and the demand structure in their, in their societies. Thank you, Kai Olaf. Now, listening to the comments that the four of you have been making, one gets a sense that there are underlying dynamics, whether they be of a more regional kind or European wide, that would suggest that populism is something that is there to stay, uh, that in some way or another, it will continue to be a phenomenon. Another school of thought, of course, might suggest that um, populism is something that comes, that grows and wanes based on a crisis situation, perhaps, uh, that happens, whether it be a financial crisis at one point or immigration crisis or the pandemic right now. Um, Catherine, I don't want you to be a prophet here necessarily, but what is your sense? How do you read 
the uh, the scene uh, in, in in Europe? Is this something that at some point we'll look back and say this was a particular phase in in European political life, or is this really something that has the makings of something that stays with us for quite a while to come? So it's a, that's a really interesting question. I mean, I think one thing is that um, as I think we more or less all kind of hinted at more or less explicitly, um, you know, if you have if you have democracy, uh, there is the temptation of of populism. If you have mass democracy, you have a t there's a you know there is a there is a drive of, uh, that's contained with it for this sort of politics. So this is why. I think if you know if we get no populism, then that's probably bad news about the state of of our democracy overall. But to you know to think about you know the relationship to crisis, I think is really important. One thing one thing about uh, populist uh, sentiment in voters and supporters, but you know, and then the way that this is. Um, uh, built upon uh, some, you know, some might say manipulated, uh, uh, you know, by populist leaders is that, you know, it is obviously easier uh, to uh, make a populist pitch and be successful at times of great uncertainty. And when people are particularly, you know, particularly feeling particularly uncertain about about their lives, about the future, about the future of, of their children. So, you know, at times of great change, um, you know, you there are two things that happen. One is that at times of great change in complex societies, Governments will make mistakes. Governments will govern. You know, mainstream governments will falter, and therefore it will be easier to point the finger. You know, at a job badly done, and you know, technocrats not knowing what they're doing. And then, of course, you know, once you have that, it's it's quite easy to capitalize uh, to capitalize on on this crisis. So I think that in this respect, you know, we have been at a moment of great adjustment. In our economies, uh, in our welfare states, in our societies, under you know the various pressures of what we refer to as as globalization. So it's no mystery, you know that 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 there is, uh, you know that there is, you know from the 1980s onwards, you know a, a slow rise and then a fast rise uh, of of populist politics. But I also think that. Um, it's interesting, you know, if we think about, it's worth thinking about the relationship of populists to crisis as we come out, you know, uh, hopefully we come out, uh, you know, of, of the COVID pandemic. And, and that is to say two things. One is that actually in most places, populists were pretty quiet during the pandemic, right? Gov you know, mainstream governments. Uh, you know, what, certainly where they were in opposition, right? Mainstream governments essentially did what it, they could uh, to safeguard people's livelihoods, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, you know, a technical crisis, you know, a health crisis doubled with an economic and potentially a financial crisis such as COVID, that's not a good crisis for the populists, right? You know, they're, they're not good at the technical stuff um, and, and, and nobody is really willing to, you know, to, uh, to, to turn against their neighbor or to turn against, you know, their, their national brethren. And we can, we can see this, you know, populist leaders in power, they had a bad pandemic. Right, whether it's uh, Bolsonaro, whether it's Trump, you know, they, they, you know, they did not do well. Populists are much, much better when they can create a crisis or create the illusion of the crisis. You know, they decide what the crisis parameters are, whether these are real or fake, and then they propose how to fix it. So, you know, they're good in a, a fake crisis or in one of their own crises. They're not good when there's when there's a good one. So. Just to finish on this, I think it's important, though, uh, in terms of the future and where we see populist movements. Right now, if we look at, you know, in, 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 in many European countries, Marine Le Pen's not doing particularly well. She didn't do very well in the last elections. <clears throat> Salvini overplayed his hand, got sidelined, uh, and, you know, and you have now have a, a government of, of, of national unity in, uh, in, in, in Italy. Um, you know, there are a number of places where populists have done very well, and, you know, it doesn't look like things are going so well for them. 
I think we have to be very careful about saying that, you know, this is the end of it. As, as uh, Kai Olaf hinted, populists are chameleons, right? They will latch on to other issues. If migration and immigration aren't working, then, you know, my money is on the idea that, you know, they will latch on to climate politics, you know, as the next uh, elite instrument against ordinary people. And we're already starting to see it. So as long as we're in a period in our societies, our globalized, advanced uh, economies of great uncertainty, of major change, of potential dislocation, and of need for adaptation, then I don't think that we're going to see the end of populist movements, but we may see them morph into very different looking animals. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, Nicole, I want to turn to you now, focus a bit more on, on Germany and, and to get your impressions. Uh, as our audience will probably know, uh, we are about to have national elections here in Germany. And of course, the eyes are often on the big established parties, but then also on the AFD, which gets a certain uh, amount of attention. Um, to what extent is populism here something that is connectable to left and right ideology? So to what extent, for example, is the party known as Die Linke, the, the left-wing party, also susceptible to populist appeals? And do we have types of populism here actually in Germany on the, on the, the left and the right flanks of the political spectrum? And how do you think that's playing out in the, in the campaign so far in the elections coming up? Um, maybe I can add one point to the crisis um, point of uh, Catherine, because um, I think that one of the points why the pandemic is not really working well for, for populist parties is that normally they need a crisis. Uh, I would um, I would totally um, say the same that they they need to create it, but also they need a crisis which they can attach to one of their outgroups. Um, so they they need a crisis that um, is working with their horizontal or vertical outgroups, um, the elite or the immigrants, um, and uh, an essential crisis like the pandemic, where everybody is um, in the same place for for um, let me, yeah in the same place. This is not really working for them. So they need their enemies to be attached to the crisis, and this is not the case in the pandemic. So maybe this is one point why um, for the AFD now um, it is not really it's not. Um, it's the same for like for most opposition parties in Europe. Um, they cannot really profit from it. Um, so they were the biggest opposition parties in the um, in the last government. Now they, um, if if the polls are right uh, or nearly right, they can be the fourth uh, or fifth biggest party in the new parliament. So um, it's it's a changing role for them, but. Um, they now are said to have like 11 percent uh, percentage percentages, so it's it's a stable it's a stable outcome for them. Um, yes, we have two populist parties in Germany. Um, like the, the definition said, the uh, link is also a populist um, left wing party, but I think it's it, the. The, the debates about these two parties are different because um, every right wing party or every radical right party in Germany has a special position in our party system. So um, the comparison, um, okay, uh, sometimes the radical right side um, compared these two as um, they, they are equally, equal, equally radical, but um, on, um, on the right side of the political spectrum, it's something, something special in um, Germany that we have um, a party that is that radical. And I think the populism is not really the, the problem here. Um, that is something I mentioned at the beginning. Um, it's more the, the anti-immigrant, the, the radical right part, which we are, we are, um, we have the bigger discussions about in Germany and why um, as some party branches are now um, under surveillance of the, of the um, secret service here. So, um, yes, we have two, two populist parties, but um, on a different level of radicalization. Um, and in this, um, the, the election campaigns of the AFD, for example, was 
really quiet, I would say. Um, they have this claim that they are doing politics for the normal people. They, um, their slogan is um, Germany, but normal and Berlin, but normal. Um, so it's a, I would say a typical um, populist claim you can make, um, but they are on some party branches, they are less radical in this campaign. Um, this is not what the election pro uh, program claims. The election program is um, even more radical than the last one and even more radical than some um, party branches um, before are. But now um, the program is very radical. The campaign is um, a classic, uh, classic populist one, which claims to make a politics for the normal people, but not um, not very um, specific in their campaign. And I think this is uh, what they're trying to do right now is not moving too far in any direction uh, to hold their, um, to get the nearly the same um, points from the last election. Thank you, Nicole. Um, Sebastian, I would like to ask you about a piece of research that you undertook uh, with some colleagues on the issue of Brexit, um, because when Brexit happened, and it already has been overtaken by so many other events, but of course we can all remember uh, the, the turbulence caused by the Brexit uh, referendum, um, and so this is also often analyzed in the context of the populist phenomenon, and, and with your colleagues, you came up with what you call different readings of this phenomenon of Brexit, in perhaps also here in the context of, of populism. Uh, please share with us uh, what some of these readings were, how you place the Brexit phenomenon in this context of, of analysis of populism. Um, thank you, Theodorus. Um, may I, uh, before I get into this, um, add a little bit to the discussion that we had before, um, because you asked the question, so do we have more populism to expect and, and what is like, what, what will be the future of populism? And I think um, we, we should again, remind, or I would like to again remind us of, the, of one definitional element that Kai Olaf mentioned before, populism is a way of politicization in the first place. And, and it's a political strategy to mobilize people. And what populism and, and populist movements did very successfully in the, in the past 10, 15 years was mobilizing people who maybe were not even voting um, years before. And I mean, Nicole, maybe you, you can correct me later if I'm, if I'm right or wrong here, but I think this is very important also for our like judgment and evaluation if populism is good or bad and so on. It's one thing. And the second thing, we, I mean, I'm not um, like uh, blaming some of someone of this discussion, but we should be careful also with the, like the usage of populism um, directly as a, something that is evil or bad. I think we need to qualify different types of populism. And I would even say, um, Nicole, you can, you can also correct me, that we, ha we had and we have in Germany even more populist parties. I'm living in Bavaria and the CSU, the Christian Social uh, Union Party is a typical like patriotic uh, regional uh, populist um, movement or let's say populist party. And of course we had uh, big people's parties before the SPD, the CDU, and I, I would I would say more on on that later in the discussion um, if if we get to this. But now um, you asked me to the Brexit and uh, about the Brexit. Um, so and I'm only briefly referring to um, a paper that I wrote with Benjamin Abrams and Amanda Machin, um, and we uh, we simply try to summarize the debate that is going on. So it's not an, a very original paper, but we came up with five different readings, that, like uh, maybe even conclusions, but I would rather say readings of the Brexit. And the five readings are Brexit can be read as an anomaly. So something that is very British, and this is, has nothing to do with the rest of the world. And this is not European. Why? Um, because Britain is like a former big colonial power. They have their own um, uh, problems, like internal problems. and 
they were not really connected to the European Union, so they simply voted for something that they were not in favor of. And like Cameron asked the question and they simply um, voted for this. But of course, this reading is very simple and this is not the end of the story. So the second reading of the Brexit would be uh, Brexit as a disorder or some like, like the, the expression of um, the changes of politics in the direction that we were already discussing before, like um, the rise of ethno-national um, sentiments, um, more um, frustration about immigration, anti-immigration sentiments, and so on. So in this sense, the third reading would be uh, the Brexit as a symptom of larger societal issues, larger societal problems um, that we not only see in Britain, but in many other countries. And some of these issues are already mentioned before, and uh, Kai Olaf also mentioned them in relation or with regard to uh, Central and Eastern Europe. This is um, on, the, on the one hand, um, like, like a larger polarization of society after um, 20, 30 years of neoliberal politics linked, of course, with um, deindustrialization that was going on in many countries. And um, this economic crisis on the one hand, or let's say not favorable e economic developments on the one hand, linked with um, opening of society in, in, in Britain and in many other countries in, in, in Europe, especially, but around the world for immigrant workers and so on led to the situation of a stronger, let's say, sentiment, at least of a certain share of the population. I mean, I mean the, the referendum was 50-50, yeah? And many people did not go for, for the voting, but at least for a certain share of the popul population that could be mobilized. So fourthly, this, the fourth reading would be the bre Brexit as a protest, a protest against uh, the so-called uh, TINA politics of uh, neoliberalism on the one hand, protest against the establishment in, in London, uh, politicians that are mainly like uh, socialized in Oxford and Cambridge in debating clubs and so on. So this would be like the fourth reading. And the, the fifth reading, of course, you, you always have to end with something positive, would be the reading of, as Brexit as something, as, as an opportunity, um, an opportunity for Britain, but also for Europe to think about um, problems on the one hand, um, and maybe avenues, future avenues on the other hand. So um, the Brexit as such does not have to be an, like a, an evil thing. Yeah, Maybe something positive is growing out of this. So in this sense, it can also be read as an opportunity. Thank you. Uh, that, that ties in with some unique factors and then some, some comparable factors in, in, in Europe. I want to jump across the, the water, so to speak, speak back to on the continent uh, and turn to Kai Olaf again. Um, Kai Olaf, you, you put the populism phenomenon in part in the context of the modernization dynamic or, or, or trauma or struggles or, or turbulence uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, to what extent are we dealing there with an urban versus rural phenomenon, with a phenomenon of uh, generations, perhaps, with older generations feeling alienated and younger generations uh, feeling more at home with the new Poland, the new Czech Republic, and so on. And if that's the case, what does it suggest for the further course of populism in politics in Central and Eastern Europe? Because if that is connected to something that over time is going to shift in terms of dynamic, uh, where is that then headed uh, in your mind? Yeah, in, in a way, in a way, um, societies are, I would not necessarily say split, but uh, polarized according to similar lines as in other parts of the world or in, 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 in Europe. So this, you mentioned the, the urban rural divide, of course, plays an important role. So uh, the governing party in Poland, PIS has its, uh, strongholds in the east uh, and in the southeast in rural areas where the catholic church is still relatively strong um, agrarian areas 
um, far away from Germany also, uh, not in the urban agglomerations. The, the party which governs uh, has only four mayors in the, in the bigger cities, over 100,000 inhabitants. So this is certainly something which, which, um, which is characteristic also here. At the same time, I mean, we have, we have some successful parties, which we call populists. And the, the peripheries, the losers of transformation, are not enough uh, for explaining the success, which means that we also here have a sort of catch, a successful, effective catch all, populist catch-all parties, which um, uh, are able to address hard segments of the new uh, middle classes. Otherwise, uh, uh, you would not have uh, in Hungary uh, support for Fidesz uh, with more than 40% or, or, or also with uh, similar results in, in, in Poland. I think what is, what is important to see, and I, I would like to, to, to emphasize this again, um, that uh, populism is a multifaceted phenomenon. It's multifaceted in the way that these are movements, groupings, parties, which are compatible with different programmatic emphasis. So here in Central East and Southeastern Europe, uh, there are social populists, there are national nationalists, pop, nationalist populists, there are populist movements which have a rather agrarian profile. There are some for which anti-corruption is in the center. They are anti-corruption one issue groupings, basically. And then you have others which you could call populists of the center. Mr. Babish in the Czech Republic, he is not a nationalist. Uh, he is one of the uh, richest Czechs. He's a, he's a, he's a millionaire. Uh, and uh, his kind of appeal was, I'm not from the political establishment and I can lead the country like a successful company. Uh, and 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 I can and I have much better skills of communicating with with the others. So we have a, a variety of of um, programmatic emphasis, which also can change. We also what we also see here, I can think quite quite clearly. Um, there are hardcore, some say carnivorous populists. They are the more the more radical ones. Um, and and those which are more modest, the borderline populists. I think they, these groups are uh, are more successful because they can also um, appeal to the to the political center, to those who uh, are more more modest in their opinions. And um, and finally, I think what is what is important. Uh, there are two types in terms of um, what do, what do these what do politicians, populist politicians want. And I think we here we have office seekers and we have policy seekers. Uh, if you look to Romania or to Bulgaria, where we also have parties of that type, if they are in power, once they are in power, they rather want to maintain the status quo because their interest is to enrich themselves, to, to ensure access to, uh, to, to resources on different levels of the political administrative system. Whereas um, uh, national conservative, rather populist groupings with a national conservative pro profile, like, like in Poland, they want to change the status quo yeah? in, in, in a way to remodel society, uh, the state, and so on and so forth. So I think this is also an important distinction which shows us again that this is a kind of a phenomenon, a phenomenon with, um, with very different faces and with the high level of adaptability. Thank you, Kai Olaf. I would like to turn with all four of you in the direction of a topic that we haven't really addressed fully yet or an angle of this issue. And that is the role of media, of the media, uh, the established media, the, the traditional media, print, television, and so on. But of course, also as get so much analysis these days, the social media as channels of information, 
false news, misinformation, mobilization, and so on, um, in your own analysis of populism, and, and feel free to focus on, on, on countries that you're familiar with or uh, cases where you feel that particularly noticeable, what is the role of the media in the, in the whole linkage with populism and in the political climate that we're in? Um, and to what extent is the rise or is the rise of the social media uh, an integral part of the, the rise of populism, of this wave of populism that we now have? And I'll begin again with uh, Catherine. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So, uh, and this this will also allow me to to circle back, if you'll allow me, to, to some of the issues about where the dangers come from in terms of populism. So I think that one of the things that's uh, interesting, if I think about the media, is that for years people talked about the United Kingdom as the great exception. There was no populism in the United Kingdom, right? Because there was no obvious populist party. Of course, you know, then we went into a different direction with UKIP uh, and, uh, and then with, with Farage and the whole of Brexit and so on and so forth. And it was only then that people noticed that actually, you know, populism was alive and well uh, in Britain and, and living in the tabloids. Uh, and that actually, you know, they, they were an extremely effective media to keep uh, the, the kind of uh, populist ideas and to basically, you know, to they, they I think that they prepared the terrain in a kind of corrosive way, right? You know, suspicion of elite, suspicion of Europe, suspicion of uh, national government, international governments, uh, migrants, you know, you name it. Um, the sun was on to this uh, 20 years ago, long before anybody was worried about UKIP or, or about Farage. So I think it's important to keep that in, to keep that in mind um, and to remember that, you know, the media as it is, and, and especially when it's not locally or nationally owned, right? Uh, especially when it's part of big conglomerates that are driven by a different kind of uh, type of, of of profit and audience seeking, you know, just very ordinary media can play this play this role. But I think that social media play a particular role in terms of, um, you know, prepping the terrain, uh, you know, and and making um, <clears throat> I think potential voters and potential supporters more receptive. And that is because you know they can cater to one of the key aspects of populism, which is, you know, creating the illusion of a direct relationship, right? Um, you know, I, I, I did a number of interviews with, you know, both Le Pen father, but mainly Le Pen uh, uh, daughter, Marine Le Pen, and, you know, they were on to this very, very early on, that they were going to be able to bypass you know, what they thought was a much too establishment based media and actually reach people differently. I think, you know, Salvini is a case in point, uh, you know, in terms of how he reached uh, his voters. I mean, this was, you know, somebody who would film himself, you know, uh, you know, and then post on Facebook, talk directly to camera, talk as if he had a direct relationship and a particular relationship with every single one of his viewers. And so I think that, you know, given how intrinsic to populism, uh, you know, that uh, directness is, and given uh, the capacity of social media to reach people directly, I think, you know, there is a very special relationship. But I just want to end on one point, you know, and that is that. Uh, you know, we, we, you know, and I, and I could have mentioned Berlusconi. Berlusconi did well. He was a media tycoon to begin with, right? Um, so I think that, but what I want to end on is the fact that, you know, that directness of relationship, that bypassing of institutions is really something that I think, you know, is a danger and it, and it kind of, um, you know, it separates out you know, the populist lights or, you know, or what I would just simply think of as, you know, people who are going for an element of demagoguery uh, because, you know, that's what you're driven to do when you need to reach to the center and be as broad as, as possible in your appeal. And the people who really are populists, when populists get into power, 
they damage representative institutions on purpose. And I think, you know, you, there is there is a desire to change them. As was said before, there is often a desire not just to bypass them, but to fundamentally alter them. And this fundamentally alters the body politic. If we look at, you know, the post Trump era, um, you know, we still have to contend with 74 million people who voted for Trump. We still have to contend with people who think that the election was stolen. We still have to contend with the fact that the, the polarization created by somebody like Trump is not something that's going to be easily mendable, right? Um, and I'm not sure that these parties about whom we say, well, they're kind of populist because they're kind of, you know, popular and so on and so forth. I don't think that they would behave in the same way were they given access, uh, you know, access to power. Thank you, Catherine. Nicole, um, the role of, of media, the traditional media, social media, what do you encounter in your research? And are there particular things, for example, again, in the context of Germany that you think are worth noting here? Um, maybe I can add just one point to Sebastian in the uh, question of voting and populism. Um, um, populist attitudes are not really... Um, so if you have a popul populist attitudes, it's not really more likely that you vote at all, but um, populist attitudes are um, possible to heighten your ideological preferences. So if you are on the right side of the political spectrum, but in the German case, for example, you would um, vote for the CDU, um, the mixture of your right-wing preferences and populist attitudes can lead you to the AFD. So they are possible to heighten your ideological preferences, but um, the possibility to vote or the, um, the possibility to vote at all is not really um, something which is linked to populism. Um, and in the media, maybe I can say something to the media usage um, of um, people with populist attitudes in Germany. And the interesting thing here is that um, they have nearly the same media diet as everyone else. Um, so we don't have these, um, for, for classical media outlets, we don't have these filter bubbles. They are not, in Germany, there are not so many alternative news outlets. So people are consuming more or less the same media um, media outlets than everyone else. Um, of course, we have the bills, so tabloid media is a, is a big thing in Germany too, but everyone else is reading them as well. So, um, yeah, it's a problem for everyone, not only for populist people. Um, but um, in social media, they are acting different because they are much more active. So the data from the last uh, general election in 2017 showed us that um, they they are much more likely to share political content, to to um, talk with people online about politics, about um, and uh, this is the same in. Um, in um, a non-media environment, so in personal political talk environments in Germany, they are um, they are not in filter bubbles as well. They are confronted with um, other opinion like everyone else, but they are talking much more about politics than people without um, populist attitudes, which is something that uh, that we should think of because these people are highly political and they have a high political interest um, and they are um, and they have a high political knowledge as our data shows so um, and they are talking more, much more about politics than everyone else online and offline so this is my maybe something uh, we should think of because it's maybe a problem for it could be a problem or it could become a problem for representative politics if um, if the people without populist attitudes are not much, not um, very active about uh, about communicating uh, politics. Thank you, Nicole. Sebastian, from a sociological point of view, again, the, the, the role of the media, and perhaps I can add something in here when it comes to the media, because we're dealing with discourse in society, and this is also an issue that has come up with our audience, the, the question of language. Uh, we tend to sort of associate populism with demagogic kind of tendencies, also in the use of, of language. And of course, that gets expressed in the media, social media, as well as traditional media. Give us your sociological perspective on this, uh, this connection between populism and, and the media. Yes, I try in a few minutes. Um, 
I mean, in, in the first place, I, I would like to emphasize um, that there is, like in our modern society, in our mass societies, there's a strong connection between the media, mass media, and the mobilization of masses. So, like, since the beginning of the radio and so on, also the big, the, the big like, nation states and also democracies were evolving. And um, we have uh, nas then nationalized media regulation and we have very like national media broadcasting through television and so on and this led to debates already in the 80s and 90s about um, media mediocracy yeah and the logic of the media in society and that uh, and then al already in the 90s and, and in the 2000s um, people were referring to Berlusconi politics and how he owned the media and he presented himself. So I just want to say that there's always this connection and um, the media can be used in this way or in the other way. Yeah, And there are a huge interests behind um, the media. And there is no, like, it's not a coincidence that now many of the billionaires and, and Amas, like um, Bezos and other people, they buy newspapers and they buy uh, media and so on. And it's also important to to um, to keep in mind that, like Robert Murdoch, the guy who runs uh, Sky, also runs Fox News, and uh, and Fox News uh, is promoting uh, like uh, politics of fear and uh, very let's say right wing sentiments, and is doing ad identity politics. So there is a uh, there is a there is a certain politics of the media going on, yeah, um, around. Um, yeah, mass mobile or with regard to mass mobilization, and I think it's important to look at to look at these structures. And you, but you were asking me about the language and demo, demagogy and and so on. I think here again, it's it's important to dis distinguish between different types of populism and populist strategies. And I would I would say like, and this was um, Catherine and Nicole were already referring to this that. Um, the right-wing populists that we now see in governments and uh, like as strong movements, they were like very good in mobilizing themselves through the so-called alternative media. And the major, let's say, broadcasting of people and the major channels of mobilization are these so-called alternative media channels. This is on the one hand social media, on the other hand YouTube and now Telegram and, and so on. And and it's it's not just like um, it's it's not like a natural evolvement. It's also a political strategy, and these political strategies are copied from one movement to another. And I think there is you have to look at these connections amongst uh, these movements. And um, apart from that, it's also and this is my final uh, comment on this. Um, we could have an, an own lecture on that. Um, it's interesting to see how now people in the so-called their Denken movement, it's really hard to translate, thinking out of the box, <laughs> it's a, not a very good translation, like people who um, mobilize on the streets against the current uh, politic, corona politics, um, they have a strong sense of um, mobilization against the establishment, against experts, against certain types of scientists, and they mobilize through uh, these so-called new media channels. And now the question is, is this populist or what is it? Yeah. So I just uh, I, I wouldn't say this is like populist in the in the sense that there that a certain populist movement is like evolving, but it's a form of protest and like a move protest movement that is building up. And very often, let's say political final sentence political um, actors they copy the strategies of protest movements. Mikhail Olaf, uh, is the Central East European context a particular context uh, when one looks at the nexus between media, social media, and uh, populism? Do many of the elements that we find in Europe generally apply there, or there are some unique uh, aspects that we need to consider? I mean, what, what one element is certainly um, probably similar to, to some countries in Southern Europe. Um, that you have a structural crisis of the media sector 
uh, since the very beginning after 1989. So the media in this part of Europe are uh, chronically underfinanced, which among others means that uh, there is only a limited scope of quality press, for example. And when, and the other element is that um, when, uh, for example, Western companies lost their interest for their business assessment and went out of some of the countries, this opened up the space for oligarchs or for, for billionaires, so like in the Czech Republic, <laughs> where the prime minister also was able to, to buy, for example, some, um, uh, some newspapers. And um, what comes, Across this is, I think here we have a really highly split or even splintered information space. So, particularly in countries where you have um, like groupings in power, which we would call uh, populists, um, uh, there we have kind of two two spheres, and they have no interfaces in a way. So these are this is this is. Uh, this is a very uh, an element which deeply catalyze, intensively catalyzes the general polarization of, of society. But I think what we should also not forget is, uh, and, and Sebastian in, in a way implicitly at least pointed at that, what, what I observe here is that um, part of this world of, the, of, of populist movements are also is a sort of civil society. Uh, so, um, civil society at first glance is usually something we consider as uh, a liberal phenomenon uh, spreading the basic values of, of democracy and so on and so forth. But here we also witness uh, conservative, the emergence of a strong conservative civil society, which is not the same as populist, but also populist movements have uh, not only their own newspapers, but also their, their own associations, uh, uh, which can uh, organize rallies and, and demonstrations. Um, in my opinion, in Poland, an important factor for the success of, of the governing party, apart from their kind of um, uh, uh, socially empathetic conservatism, um, has been the fact that they, before they were in power, had uh, there there was a um, a network of uh, of think tanks of uh, of intellectuals who were able to um, uh, to 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 achieve the discursive hegemony versus vis-a-vis -vis the uh, the liberals who were complacent uh, and who were very passive in a way. So I think media are important, but we should not. Um, forget about the changes and developments in what we call civil society in a broader in a broader way. Also, the intellectual landscape has um, has 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 changed. Thank you, Kai Olaf. Uh, I am uh, mindful of the time that we have reached, and I want to go around one more time as a, as a conclusion. And I'm going to ask you, to, all four of you, to respond hopefully very briefly, very concisely, to perhaps a thesis statement. Uh, and the thesis statement would be, uh, the populist phenomenon can help strengthen democracy in Europe. The populist phenomenon can help strengthen democracy in Europe. You can agree or disagree with that thesis, but I'd like to get your responses to that. And once again, we'll begin with Catherine. Um, I think protest, uh, mobilization, the calling into question by civil society of the status quo um, can certainly strengthen democracy. I think that um, when it is weaponized by unscrupulous leaders who have a, a very different idea in the back of their mind, uh, which is how I would think of populism, whether it's slightly left or slightly right, we can go into that. Uh, I don't think it's the road to strengthening democracy, no, but protests and mobilization certainly are. Thank you. Nicole, your turn. 
Um, I think the element of people centrism is something that can strengthen democracy because a lot of people would agree that um, in, in representative democracies, um, there is something something left with a with a linkage between people and leaders. Um, so the more people centrism could be a good thing for democracy and maybe a reminder that democracy is something that can change over time and should be changed over time. Um, but on the other hand, as we see in a lot of um, European countries, um, it populism can help to normalize, um, for example, radical right parties. Um, and this is something which is not a good thing for democracy. Okay, Sebastian, your take on this thesis. Yeah, I was hoping for, let's say, more controversial statements or let's, at, at least statements that I can oppose, but I would be like on the same road, so to speak. And I would say that um, there can not be democracy without, let's say, a certain type of populist um, mobilization. And I would like to remind again about this articulation of certain um, needs and demands that is linked with populism. But again, I would say it's important to keep in mind that there are different ways and different types of and different styles connected also with the language question of populism. And if populism leads to intolerance, if populism in terms of identity politics excludes people, if it, uh, if it is based on the politics of fear, if it's um, linked with uh, only with resentments and 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 like uh, like yeah, um, playing with crisis, creating crisis. I think it's not a good thing. And Kai Olaf has the last word on this thesis statement from a Central and East European perspective, perhaps. I I think populism is uh, necessarily ambivalent in this respect. It's. Uh, it, it is a threat, but it can be a stimulus and for democracy, and it can be a stimulus provided that those who consider themselves not to be populists uh, learn the lessons and uh, find the right um, ways to address this phenomenon. That's not an easy, an easy task, but I would say uh, provided uh, we all learn to differentiate and to appropriately describe and analyze the phenomenon, what we try to do today, provided the so-called established political forces revitalize by, for example, opening up the political space again. So I think uh, part of the problem is always the strength of populists is the weakness of the others. And uh, I think what we need in functioning democracies, and here I'm a little bit, say, a traditionalist, we need political parties which are distinguishable. So social democrats, which are social democrats, who are social democrats, Christian democrats, who are social democrats, liberals, who are liberals, and not a sort of uh, great uh, competition to the center where usually elections are won, but now we see that the center is not everything. So I think in a way we have to, the parties, political parties have to, to revitalize also by, and we have this concept in Germany of Programmparteien, yeah? no one, political parties based on manifestos, no one reads party manifestos, but uh, Party manifestos ensure that parties have a certain ideological profile or a core, and in a way it also ensures this distinctiveness. And finally, I think uh, um, uh, communication. Uh, so um, the, the those who are um, those who consider themselves not to be populists uh, um, have to improve their skills to communicate and also their abilities. Do not neglect um, issues. Though what we can observe in some in some in some cases is that populist parties are successful because they have what is called the issue ownership, because these are important questions which were neglected by the others, and they, in a sometimes very nasty, very very <laughs> very very robust way, 
pick up and then they are those who represent the issue in a way we may in the, the, uh, in, a, in a way which is not very helpful or very very useful for democracy so it is ambivalent i would say and um, it depends on on what um, uh, the uh, political parties the uh, the political pro how the political process is organized in the future thank you kai olaf perhaps it's not uh, too bad to end on a note of ambivalence, because perhaps that is really inherent uh, in this whole phenomenon of populism. Uh, we could, of course, continue our discussion uh, much, much longer than the time we have available. Uh, I really want to thank our panelists for sharing such wide ranging insights into this topic. I also want to thank our audience members want to remind everyone that we have recorded this event and that it will be posted on the YouTube channels of the two sponsoring programs, uh, FUBEST and FUBIS. Uh, on behalf of these programs, uh, I want to thank the panelists. I want to thank you, the, the audience. And uh, we're also going to give you a bit of a preview here uh, because we will have one more session, discussion session coming up this year. Uh, where we are going to be looking at the uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, and take a look at it from a gender perspective and asking ourselves the questions, what lessons have we learned, um, not just in, in Europe, not just in Germany, but perhaps also worldwide. That is going to be taking place on November the 18th. Uh, it will be announced again, but this is a, uh, a quick early announcement. And uh, we also want to point out the way in which we are present on social media. Speaking of social media, uh, you can see both programs uh, at various uh, social media sites. With that, again, I thank the panelists. I thank the audience. I wish everyone well and hope that everyone will tune in again for our next session in November. Take care. Goodbye. <laughs>